I'd like to really welcome you all, uh, wherever you are um, in Sutton Coldfield or beyond, uh, to this evening's talk, an illustrated history of Moor Hall Hotel and Spa. My name is Zoe Toft. I know several of you have been at uh, previous talks uh, that Folio has hosted uh, in this series. Uh, but in case you don't know, Folio is, the, uh, is a small local charity that supports the public libraries in Sutton Coldfield. And it gives me a very great pleasure indeed to welcome tonight Angela Burns and Kate Kinson from Moor Hall Hotel and Spa. Angela Burns is the CEO for the Web Hotel Group, which includes Moor Hall, and Kate Kinson is the, is the marketing manager. They're going to be taking it in turns to talk uh, this evening uh, as they go through their slides. And so I'm sure you all join me now in giving a very warm welcome to Angela, who's going to kick us off this evening. Thank you, Angela, over to you. Thank you very much. Well, as Zoe said, I'm Angela Burns. I'm the CEO of Moor Hall Hotel and Spa. I'm also part of the family that's owned Moor Hall since my father bought the hotel in 1961. Moor Hall has been part of my life since a very early age, and I'm delighted to be able to share some of that history with you tonight. I'm presenting with Kate, our marketing manager, and we're going to take, you, uh, take a look back as far as we can into the history of this iconic Sutton Coldfield venue. Moore Hall Hotel and Spa is celebrating 60 years of family ownership in 2021 and has a long and colourful history. The original Moore Hall was built in the 1500s and was home to Bishop Beasley, who frequently entertained royalty here. We understand that the hall was rebuilt again in the 1800s, and that the current Moor Hall was built by Colonel Ansel of Brewery fame in 1903, and he lived here with his family and 10 servants. My father, Michael Webb, bought Moor Hall in 1961, when he and a friend thought that Sutton Coldfield could do with a venue for late night drinking and dancing. So Moor Hall became known for its dancing and frivolity many nights of the week in the 60s and 70s. We as a family have continued to invest in Moor Hall over the years, and now, after 60 years of ownership, the hotel boasts 83 bedrooms, two restaurants, six meeting rooms, and a leisure club and spa. We will now look back on the history of Moor Hall and how the hotel has developed over the past 60 years. We we'll start by looking back as we can to the 1300s, Black Death and the Hundred Years' War. Records from the 1300s show that Moor Hall was first named for William de la Moor, a landowner in this area. The first historical fact that was recorded about Moor Hall was in 1434, but very little is known of this period, except that a gentleman by the name of Roger Harwell lived here. Following the, during the following years, William Harmon lived at Moor Hall with his son, John Harmon, the future Bishop Easy. He may have been born at the old Moor Hall, a modest two-storey sandstone house in 1465. So now we come to Moor Hall's most famous owner, Bishop Vesey, who had a meteoric rise under Henry VIII. In 1527, Henry VIII granted Bishop Vesey several plots of land known as Moor Hall Cross and Heath Yard, together with about 40 acres of wasteland. Upon this land, he built the new Moor Hall, which was near to the old building where he was born. At the new Moor Hall, he lived, supported by 140 servants who were required to wear scarlet caps and gowns. Very little is known about the new building built by Beasley, but the drawing here shows an imposing Queen Anne style property. Sir Bishop Beasley was once a tutor to Princess Mary, who spent most of her early life at Moor Hall. Beasley survived the fall of Wolseley in 1529 and prospered under. Thomas Cromwell until 1551, when his opposition to the Reformation caught him up and he was deprived by Edward VI of his bishop for exchange for a pension of £485 a year. He was restored when Roman Catholic Queen Mary came to the throne in 1553. In 1528, Beasley was able to perform his best remembered act on behalf of his fellow townsmen. He'd been on several important journeys for Henry VIII and was at the height of his prosperity at court when the king granted him the thousands of acres which now form Sutton Park. With this land, Vesey obtained a charter which placed the manor and those of Sutton Coldfield to the trust of a corporation for the use of the inhabitants of Sutton Coldfield forever. It is reported that Sutton Coldfield was granted the Royal Tudor Rose by King Henry VIII in 1539. 
Thanks for being aided by a young woman who shot dead with, a, with an arrow, a wild boar, which was charging at the king in 1928. He asked for the person responsible to come forward and a young woman from Sutton Coalfield came out of the trees. Bishop Beasy was president was present at the incident and he also returned the disposed lands of the young woman's family. Bishop Vesey died at the ripe old age of 103 in 1555. During his life, he rebuilt the aisles of the Holy Trinity Church and installed an organ. He built a market, paved the streets of the town and had two stone bridges built. The one at Minworth still survives. He had Sutton Park gifted to the residents of Sutton for common use. He founded and endowed the Free Grammar School and built 51 stone houses, of which five still survive. So we are proud to have the blue plaque on the exterior of Moor Hall for Bishop Beasy. So moving forward, Moor Hall was inherited by his nephew, whose name was also John Harmon, and the house passed down through the family and was eventually sold. Nearly 100 years later, in 1671, the new holder of Moor Hall was John Addis. When he died, he left Moor Hall to his great nephew, John Hackett, whose family also owned Moxall Hall. Grateful to his great uncle, Hackett added Addis to his name. By the 18th century, Moor Hall was said to comprise 20 rooms on three floors, but said to be a very poor pile of building, without prospect or indeed anything beautiful recommend it to a man of taste. The property was rebuilt again in the mid 18th century at a reputedly high cost. Moore Hall was let to tenants in the 19th century. One known owner of Moore Hall in the 19th century is A.R.D., who was nicknamed the Carpet King due to his financial success in the carpet manufacturing business. The Lloyd brothers came to Moore Hall in 1866. They were, eight, they were iron masters and mine owners, but also bankers and founders of Lloyd's Bank. Sampson Lloyd was living at Moor Hall in 1871, described as county magistrate, manufacturing engineer and bank director. He lived here with his Prussian wife, eight children and nine servants. Next we come to Colonel Ansel of Rigby Hall, Bromsgrove, who wanted to move to Sutton Coalfield. He was a wealthy man, a Birmingham alderman, and the owner of Ansel's Brewery. So in 1903, he bought Moor Hall. Moor Hall, with its Regency frontage, was vacant at the time. Records show Colonel Ansel wrote an account of his visit there and wrote, some of the rooms are large, but they have the air of antiquity hanging about them. He saw an old oak chair, described as Bishop Beasley's chair, and in the library, he claimed to have seen a book published in 1452. Printing was invented in 1450. Colonel Ansel demolished the old hall and erected the present building. The new Moor Hall copied the Tudor star chimneys and added a clock tower. Colonel Ansel lived with his wife, two of his grown up children, and 10 servants. All of the wood carvings and stonework were created on site, and architects from all over the country came to admire the workmanship which can still be seen today in the stained glass windows, half mantles over the fireplace and stonework. The Ansel family lived at Moor Hall until 1930 when the whole estate was auctioned off and bought by the Strether family for £35,000. Mr Strether converted Moor Hall into a gentleman's residence where a retired gentleman spent most of the day buried in the times. Strether's Limited built the majority of the houses in Moorhall Drive and Little Sutton Lane from around 1930 to 1960. We have a few photos um, where we've shown what it looked like in the 1930s compared to today. So this is the lounge bar and you can see what it looks like today. This is our terrace and the lady in the photo is sitting on the window sill of the Oak Room restaurant and a similar shot of what it looks like today. This view overlooks the golf club and the surrounding parkland at Moor Hall and what it looks like today. And 
This is a photo of our Ladywood room by the lounge bar and a similar photo today. And our sunken garden. And what it looks like today. My father, Michael Webb, the current chairman of Moorhorn, in partnership with Whistles Wines, purchased Moorhorn in 1961. It was still a gentleman's residence with 17 bedrooms, two bathrooms, and a great deal of potential. Dad remembers, in 1961, I was sitting with a friend, Brian Hildick of Whistles Wines in Austria, being around 30 years of age. We were living it up at Preski style, late into the night, singing, dancing, and drinking. I remarked that Sutton Coalfield needed a place like this. And when we came home, we started to look around Sutton Coalfield for a suitable old house that could be turned into a drinking club with late night licenses. All the, out, all the old houses that were for sale were turned down by the planners who would not grant a change of use. And then someone suggested we look at Moore Hall. I'd never heard of it before as it was down a long private drive. Although licensed, it was more of a private hotel in the normal sense of the word and people seemed to stay there on a permanent basis, either those who had retired or widowers still working. There was a small cupboard in one room with drinks in it, which was unlocked to order and locked again very swiftly. If you asked to have a visitor for a meal, then a day's notice was required. Moore Hall opened in August 1961 as a private members club because this was the only day, way that we were going to be able to serve drinks after hours. Our initial subscription was two guineas a year, and we still have some original members who continue to pay their two pound and 10 pence a year. Over the first year or so of ownership, the old gentleman gradually moved out as the style of business changed and their quiet life was disrupted by, by the music and the dancing. Dad remembers one resident came to me one day and said, Mr. Webb, I fear you're not running this hotel the way I'm used to, and I'm afraid I'll have to give you notice. He was not dismayed by this, as he was, the gentleman was paying a very cheap rate compared to the market at the time. The guest then requested to be paid for the bathroom that he would paid for. My dad told him to take it with him, which of course he couldn't, but he did take the rather nice mahogany toilet seat. I think that was more out of spite than me. We started off by offering much dancing and frivolity several nights of the week, mostly with a different live band each night, since discos were only just emerging in those days. One of my earliest memories was our treat to come for lunch at the hotel every Saturday. The hotel always served delicious hot sponge pudding, where the choice for our customers was custard or cream. We as children were allowed to have both, so that was definitely a perk. I started work at the hotel when I was 14. I was, used to come straight from school and work until about eight o'clock. My job was telephone operator. There were no mobiles or direct dial telephones then. It was an old, old fashioned GPO switchboard with connected, which connected through plug cords. I managed to cut a few guests off over the years pulling the wrong connections, I can assure you. In the 1970s, the style of business changed when, in the words of Michael and Jean Webb, they grew, up a, they grew up a bit. Meeting rooms and an additional bedroom block were built to cater for the conference customer and the business guest. In 1972, the Bracebridge room was opened and a conference room and Moore Hall was granted a full licence. The hotel changed from a residential club to Moore Hall Hotel and Country Club. The photo on the previous slide is of Mrs Webb who sadly passed away in 2007. The photo is taken outside the front entrance of the hotel and you can see now the spa entrance behind her and the old reception. In 1973, work started to convert the old coach houses, stables and kennels into an annex of 31 bedrooms, which would bring the total number of bedrooms to 48. Bedrooms were televisions were available on request. One of the old bedrooms. We now have a selection of adverts, menus and news clippings from the 1970s. The residential club was still going strong in the 1970s with over 2,000 members. 
who enjoyed facilities such as late night, late night bars, dancing four nights of the week, Friday night barbecues on the patio in the summer, gourmet dinners in the winter, bar at displays in November and festive dinners and dances. No member under the age of 21 was allowed to join and the manager saw every applicant of membership. We continue to... We continue to invest and adapt the hotel in the 1980s with a £1 million extension with a new charter suite and more bedrooms. In 1982, a new hotel reception was built to join the annex to the main building, along with eight new bedrooms. Jake's Winer Diner was opened in what is now the country kitchen just off our reception. There was a pinball machine and the menu featured American beer, cocktails and burgers. The new charter suite was built after the £1 million investment, and many of you have probably been here as it's where we hold our main functions and weddings. In an average year, we now host 75 weddings, so we've probably hosted more than 2,000 weddings during our 60-year ownership. Now I'll show you a selection of adverts, newspaper clippings and menus from the 1980s. You might just be able to see on this, this was our Christmas menu um, and the restaurant, you can see it's 16 pounds. Uh, for the meal, we now charge £125 per person, so a huge difference from then. In the 1990s, we continued to invest in the hotel. In 1991, the fitness centre was built to include an indoor swimming pool, which was quite a rarity for hotels in those days. The fitness club was opened by Graham Taylor, who was the manager of the England football team. At the same time, an in-house laundry was built and due to the reorganisation of this space, we increased our conference rooms by two. In the 1990s, the sunken garden was listed to help protect and preserve this historic site. It was said that in the time of Henry VIII, it was a bear pit or cockpit. It was altered to a sunken garden in the late 19th century as it was very popular at that time to have these stone grottoes and fountains. It's a beautiful place and very popular with our wedding couples for photographs. You can see it's changed very little since the photo we saw previously in the 1930s. In the 2000s, we started to extend our portfolio with the acquisition of sister hotels and businesses. And we also continue to invest in more horse facilities. In the year 2000, the Webb family bought the George Hotel an old coaching inn in Litchfield, and set about refurbishing every bedroom and bathroom. The George has 45 rooms, a popular bar and restaurant, and a large Regency-style ball ballroom. In 2002, Moore Hall was awarded four AA stars. We have tried to work out how many people have stayed at our hotel over the past 60 years of ownership, and we believe it's over 1 million guests. On average, 2020 not included, around 30,000 guests stay annually in our hotel. We use and recommend local businesses and suppliers and support many local causes and charities. We work with local tourism attractions to attract ledger guests to the area and work with many corporate businesses to provide a home from home for our business travellers. In 2003, Moorhall became the first hotel to achieve premier status in Best Western. Moore Hall has a long history with Best Western who market our hotel nationally and internationally. All Best Western hotels are individually owned like Moore Hall. My dad was instrumental in bringing Best Western to the UK in 1960s and 70s and was made chairman of Best Western in 1980 on his 50th birthday. I was made chairman in 2013, the first female chairman and the first two people from the same family who have been in the chair. I still sit on the board at Best Western, so we as a hotel are very much involved 
in the hotel industry nationally. In 2003, the new Leisure Club Centre was opened again, again by Graham Taylor, who was then the Villa football manager. The centre had a new first floor gym, spa beauty rooms and a studio. In 2007, we continued our expansion and bought the Gables Hotel in Falfield near Bristol. This hotel has 46 rooms and is just off the M5, so perfect for a pit stop when visiting Devon or Cornwall. In the 2010s, we focused on our environmental commitment. As part of our continued efforts to reduce our impact on the environment, we installed a wormery system to compost the organic waste from the kitchen and restaurants in 2010. In 2011, we stored two electric car charging points, installed solar panels on the walls of our laundry and began to produce our own honey. We've won various green tourism awards, including the Energy Reduction at the Birmingham Council Green Restaurant Awards, and have had the prestigious Gold Award from the Green Tourism Business Scheme for many years. The Big Hoot Trail, trail came to Sutton Coalfield and Moor Hall was home to the Love Owl. Over 90 beautifully designed owl statues came to Birmingham and the surrounding districts in the summer of 2015 the Big Hoot Trail raised funds for Birmingham Children's Hospital and brought lots of visitors to the re region. And in 2016, the Webb family added another hotel to its portfolio with the acquisition of the Cathedral Hotel in Mitchfield. In 2018, Moore Hall's main function room, the Charter Suite, had a refurbishment to help appeal to the modern wedding market. And the hotel was awarded an outside wedding license in the sunken garden, so couples can now say I do in this magical setting. In 2018, we invested £100,000 to refurbish the gym with new interactive cardio and strength training equipment. Our leisure club has around 700 members from the local area, and our facilities are also used by our hotel guests and spa guests. So it's great to have such an amazing space to set us apart from our competition. In 2018, we took the, the ownership of the Red Lion, which is a small village pub in Newborough, Staffordshire, just between Litchfield and Burton-on-Trent. In 2019 and 2020, we picked up awards for Above and Beyond at the prestigious National Blue Badge Awards, Best Large Business at the Sutton Coalfield Chamber Awards, Excellent Hospitality at the Birmingham Chamber Awards, and the Thrive at Work Wellbeing Bronze Award. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit the world. These are some pictures of our empty spaces, not what we're used to. But obviously, life changed dramatically. The hotel closed in March 2020 for the first time in its long history. The family moved into the hotel during lockdown for maintenance and security and to keep things ticking over. We opened a shop during the first few weeks of lockdown when toilet rolls, flowers and eggs were scarce, something we have in abundance. We reopened again in July when lockdown lifted and have since been in various stages of lockdown, each time adapting the business to make it safe and comfortable for our guests. Recently, we've adapted again to offer takeaway afternoon teas and meals for special events like Mother's Day and St. Patrick's Day, so people can celebrate at home. We continue to be open for business guests to stay, but it is a very different experience with our restaurants closed and limited staff. We are really looking forward to opening again fully this summer. And with the latest government announcement, we are planning ways to welcome guests back to the gym, the restaurant, the spa, and to start hosting weddings again and events making more whole the much loved business that it has been for 60 years. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Kate, Angela. Uh, I think everybody in the audience will have been enjoyed this talk in particular has been quite different from some of our other talks in the series in that you've brought the, the history right up to 
virtually today. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of the images you showed from the 60s, 70s and 80s, I suspect that they will have brought back memories for, for people in, in the audience. And so if anybody's got any memories that they'd like to share or, or comments, please uh, do uh, submit them uh, via the, the, the Q&A function. Uh, if uh, Kate and Angela are able to answer them, they will do. Uh, and otherwise, uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to take them and, uh, and get back to you afterwards. Um, I particularly uh, enjoyed looking at the menus. So I, one thing that caught my eye was the smoked eel Bacchus. Yes. I'm not quite sure what that was. Uh, and I'm not sure that I'd be brave enough to order it. Um, but uh, that sounded very good. And I, I thought um, uh, your descriptions of the party nights and the discos and the dancing and the, the 12 pier pint um, uh I was thinking, oh gosh, we're all longing for those sorts of occasions. I mean, 12, not, not the 12 pier pint, I don't think that will ever be returning, but uh, the, the, the opportunity to, to come together like that. So um, uh, thanks very much. So um, one of the questions that's come through is what's uh, mm -hmm. your, um, how does the hotel link with the golf club? And could you talk about that? Uh, yeah, um, the land was sold separately to the hotel and to the golf club, so we don't have any ownership or anything to do with the golf club, apart from the fact that we have all the views, we have none of the maintenance, we have none of the members, <laughs> the, the golf club members, which can be an advantage, um, but it's, it does mean that uh, we can use, obviously, the, um, the golf club, you know, our guests can use it and stay with us. We quite often um, provide the dining for golf club uh, days, um, but we don't have any ownership and we don't have any rights to, to using the, um, the greens or the, the course. So can book. Uh, maybe, maybe I missed it. Did you say when, when that land was sold for the golf course? When the land was split up for the um, hotel and the houses down the drive, the golf course, it was sold to the directly to a golf club to make to, to the golf club. It wasn't part of our land. Uh, so that was set up before actually you took over? Yes, way before. Right, thanks. Um, uh, a very straightforward one. Are you doing anything by way of takeaway teas or refreshments, a bit like New Hall Hotel? I think uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a, a question about today, not about the history, but- um... Yeah, no, no, we're, we're only doing it to order. And uh, so we do takeaway um, and delivery afternoon teas every Sunday. Uh, and then we're doing special, we do we did Valentine's, we did Christmas Day, New Year's Eve, and that sort of thing. We're doing St. Patrick's and Mother's Day. But it, it just doesn't make, there's not enough traffic past Moor Hall to make e economic sense to have staff in um, on the off chance that people might call. Okay. Um, somebody has uh, said they particularly enjoyed the wedding photos. They recognised one of the couples from a <laughs> wedding that they attended. So uh, that, that, that I'm sure put a smile on on that uh, member of the audience's face. Uh, we've got another question. Do any part of the older buildings remain? Um, so any, I guess, from the pre-1904 rebuild? No, unfortunately not. Um, I guess there's some parts of the sunken garden that are original, um, but nothing in the actual hotel building. Right, so you have no uh, knowledge of where the uh, 1452 book for the old oak chair went no I can see <laughs> see you looking rather rueful at that. yeah <laughs> that'd be lovely brilliant so um I've got a question here how long did the cave survive how um, long did the cave survive I'm not sure if that's the um is that the reference to the um American diner was that called something or am I possibly um, oh gosh, I don't know how long we had that. We probably had Jake's Diner for probably seven or eight years, I suppose, before we converted it to another restaurant. It sort of, it, you know, did its course. Louise, who put that question, if I've misinterpreted your um, answer, please do uh, post a clarification and we'll, and we'll pick it up. Um, uh, I've got an, a question. Do you recall the name of the nightclub in the early 80s. It's this person's earliest recollection of Moorhall, but they're trying to remember the name of the nightclub. Cellar bar. And if you can't remember it tonight, say again. Was it the cellar bar? Is that when we did the nightclub the down cellar. in the cellar? 
the cellar bar. Yeah, we, we, we started off um, where the swimming, well, where the ladywood room is, sort of swimming pool. That's where we started off with the discos. Um, and then when we wanted to use it a bit more for functions, we transferred it down into the cellars of the hotel. And it was called the cellar bar. Okay, so maybe um, if, if that's your memories of uh, dancing the night away in the in the cellar bar, uh, and, and they're, they're safe enough memories to share with us, do, do, do tell I us. I have no records of it. <laughs> <laughs> what happened in the cellar bar stayed in the cellar bar, I think. Brilliant. Um, so somebody just wants to say that a really great talk. Love the slides of the history. Um, this person's actually never been to Moore Hall, but will definitely come when the restaurant is open again. So mm -hmm. brilliant. Um, um, this member of the audience stayed in the hotel in the mid 1990s and had always wanted to stay in a four poster bed. Um, you had one room with this, apparently. Is this still there or have the rooms been modernised? No, we've still got four posters. Excellent. Okay. They are a bit more modern than they were in the 1990s, but the four posters we still got. <laughs> well, 21st century four posters. Excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, Keith in the audience has asked, you've used the term gentleman's residence several times. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit on, on what you mean by this? Um, yeah, it was it was just a, um, a hotel for people, for long stay residents. It wasn't like what, what, what you'd imagine as a, it was a bit like an, a, an old people's home in a way, but it was for gentlemen that had been widowed mainly that you know their wife had obviously done all their housework and cooking in the past and they couldn't cope on their own um so it was very stuffy you know they all used to dress for dinner they always used to sit at their own table you know they never used to mix um they used to sit in the lounge and read the times and really not not mix awfully um that's interesting i hadn't realized that it was sort of a, yeah a residential home rather than a yeah a, fantastic um so somebody uh, is commenting on the wonderful disco night on Wednesday nights in 1975. Now, Angela, I see you're nodding your head. Can you, can you tell us anything more about these wonderful disco yeah, nights? Yeah, well, we had disco nights in, on Wednesdays and Sundays every week, and they were incredibly popular. Um, I often speak to people, and they said, oh, that's where I met my wife or my uh, husband or whatever. And I think, actually, that some people probably got divorced and met a new not wife or new husband uh, here. I heard that sometimes as well. <laughs> um, actually, we've got a wonderful... Um, David Brooks is one of the members of our audience. I wouldn't normally name the audience, but um, he's Dave. He was one of the resident DJs, along with Malcolm J, right through the 1970s. I remember. Um, with our team, providing discos for two weddings on one Saturday. So uh, now, now I want the soundtrack of the wedding, Dave. <laughs> 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 that would be good brilliant thank you for, for for sharing that with us david um rachel asks what, what are your plans for the hotel in the future now i imagine that's quite probably quite difficult to answer given what this last year has been like but i don't know have you got things that you'd like to do or things that are in the process of happening so, do you want to talk about the woods yeah we just want to make more of the woodlands is one of the big things on my list this year, next year. Um, we've got a fantastic woodlands. Um, I've done a fairy door trail around it. Um, we've got some artwork going up in it. Um, our gardener who featured on a few of the photos because he used to be the chef, so he's been here a while. Um, he's doing so much work in there, um, restoring it, building paths. Um, we've put wish trees up so people can come and tie a ribbon and make a wish. Um, I just want it to be a real magical space. So I'm just trying to figure out ways where we can actually make money from it as well. Um, so outside dining, um, different woodland kind of activity. Experiences. So, so you mentioned outside dining now, just before the talk opened to the public this evening, we were talking about uh, the timescale for going forward and actually you said outside dining is going to be the first thing that has the chance to come back um, later this year is that going to be in the in the forest are you or the woods area or is that going to be on your patio do you, do you anticipate um, a bit of mix um but obviously to get outside dining up and running needs a lot of investment and understanding a concept that's in my head what i'm trying to do so at the moment we're, we're trying to work through it but 
I would love nothing better than to have like an oak room outdoors event every month, um, pop-up dining experiences, but in the woodlands because that's what people want at the moment. We want to be able to meet friends and family and catch up with people, but in a safe environment outside is going to be a big part of hotel life for the next year. So, But the woodlands so, won't be ready on the 12th of April, that's no, for sure. No, so no, the outside no, dining no. is going to be on the terrace. And on, on the, the radar. I'm, yeah, that's what really, I'm hoping. Well, that, that sounds like a really uh, exciting plan, developing outdoor space. Uh, I love that. And I, I, I love the photos of the sunken garden as, uh, as well. Yeah. Another, and seeing it set up for the wedding was uh, you know, that's spectacular. Uh, we've got a question. Do you know how many members are still paying do two guineas a year as their membership? That is spectacular value, she says. <laughs> I think there's about 60 or 50 or 60. Um, every, it's quite a lot. Yeah, more than you think. Um, so every September I get a list of people that haven't cancelled their direct debit, whether they have died or um, just decided to cancel their direct debit. But I get a list of people that still every year pay their £2.10 whatever it is to be a, a more poor resident um, and what that means nowadays is they get a discount off their meals and drinks and stays here um, but they get a little membership card every year that yeah so that's lovely that's, that's, that's still fantastic. going yeah so so in the in the early days we started at two pound ten which was two guineas then we moved to four guineas we went right up to four guineas the next I mean in, in over years this was so we we still got people paying four twenty then we went to 550, so we still got people paying 550, and then we had a couple of increases after that. And there's so we have a range of people that still pay, um, just because they get some discounts, but also just be out of nostalgia. I think you know, two pound, ten pence, or four twenty is neither here nor there, and I think they just like paying it still. They get a, a membership card um, still, you know, so it's just a bit of nostalgia. Really. That would be lovely to see the collection of membership cards throughout the, the ages and, yeah. and get a photo of all those members. They were a different colour every year. So we could, because obviously you had to be a member to get in. So we had to make sure that they were current and that they paid their membership fee. So every year the colour of the card changed so we could know who was using an old one or a new one. Brilliant. Well, yeah, that, that sounds like a great, a great display that, that could be made. And we've got another memory here. I've been for Xmas lunch, Christmas lunch with the St. Michael Luncheon Club and hope that we can continue this year. It's a highlight of the year for many Boldmere residents. So Yeah, we still we still operate the luncheon club. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got a question here. Can uh, it's about the fairy trail in the woodlands? And uh, is that something that anybody can visit or is that for, for hotel guests or, or could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, so anyone can do it. You can just come along and do it. I would say leave it a month or so because the doors aren't looking their best and I've got new doors going up um that are just in the you mean, you mean the fairies the fairies have got new doors going up the fairies <laughs> have got new doors and they've delivered them to me to get them excellent our gardener's done a massive new door under a tree it looks amazing so we're just yeah we are working hard to make it look really special and yeah so the idea when we launched it was just that you come for a hot chocolate and a cake in the bar and then just have a walk around the woodlands because the way I see the more people that go to the woodlands and tell us that they live the woodlands I get more money or investment back in the woodlands so that's how I want to go forward. Brilliant. But, but so the, the, the fairies and the elves I've got a bit, a bit of work to do in the next few weeks. Yes. And, and, they're just uh, they're busy at the moment. Okay so wait until the, the spring flowers are really in bloom before you. Yeah there's the loads of bluebells down there in April so it's a real special place. Excellent. Okay, well, um, um, our next question. Oh, well, this is a suggestion for your outside room. You could consider a picnic basket to eat in the grounds. There you go. There's a there's a. An what is you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, we um, will be starting. Um, well, Kate, do you want to talk about it? We're just trying. Yeah. Um, when we reopen on the twelfth of April, we're trying a new graze box. Bring your own picnic blanket, or bring our picnic blanket. And yeah, come for a graze nibbly box of meats and cheeses and stuff. Just a new concept to try and get people to, um, yeah, enjoy outside space. Sounds lovely. Um, so part of enjoying the outdoor space, I have a very practical question here from a, a member of the audience. Uh, are they allowed to bring a dog? 
what are the rules on dogs on the outdoor fairy trail? Not at the moment. Um... Okay, that's fine. I was just uh, checking that. Um, so uh, I've got a question here. Are bedrooms that, that used to be for the staff now used as guest bedrooms? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're all converted to guest bedrooms. In fact, we well, had a staff flat, um, and that is now a suite that we've converted. So we've got it's got the bedroom, it's got a sitting area, it's got a huge bathroom and a huge shower room because uh, it used to be a staff flat. Sounds like a a, a good suite. Um, so somebody's mentioned here that you have a performing arts group, the Wings Performing Arts, that has done shows, uh, and I don't know whether you can. Uh, tell us a little bit about that or um, yeah that they do loads of um so we work really closely with wings um they're based in kingsbury and um they're fantastic they do any event we want um uh, we can tell them the most craziest idea and they'll come up with another crazy idea so we do lots of afternoon teas with them where they perform and they sing and the choir um murder mysteries different comedy dining events they'll be we've already organized our massive christmas program with them it's trying to fit them in for the rest of the year at the moment because we're so busy with weddings that have been displaced last year, mm. this year, moving forward. So at the moment, we don't have very much availability um, to do all our special events, but we're just trying to work it all out. So we will have wings back as soon as we can. And all our events are tribute nights, our murder mystery evenings, anything we can do because, yeah, we just wanting to see the hotel busy again. Absolutely, and I think everybody here tonight um, uh, would, would second that. And uh, I think perhaps we've gone through, oh, oh, is Ladies Day on the 17th of June going ahead this year at Moor Hall? Is that, have you any yes. plans for that? Hopefully, that's the one we've kind of, oh, actually it's the 17th of June, isn't it? So it's before. Yeah, we're fine because we can do inside dining, but it will only be uh, socially distanced tables in households. Um, to, you know, two households or rule of six. Yeah, um, just working out ways we can get the bookmaker to come to the tables instead of them going up to the bookmaker. And so, yeah, we are working on that one. Because it's just before the, the magic yeah. date, isn't it? Great, but at least you've got plans. Okay, yeah, so we, we're trying to work it out, make sure that it's viable with a, less numbers because it's quite an expensive event to put on with all the screens. So uh, we're hoping it'll go ahead, yeah. Brilliant, okay, well, um, it's lovely to hear that there are so many plans for sort of the next stage in Moore Hall's history. Um, you know, we, we've done quite a lot tonight, haven't we, starting uh, 800 odd years ago <laughs> uh, and through it all. And it, it's been fascinating and, and lovely to see, I think, particularly those photos that um, were from, say, the 30s. And then you match them with modern photos uh, showing. So I'm sure I'm not the only person in the audience who will be, uh, you know, can't wait for the opportunity to come and walk uh, around uh, and ultimately come and visit you when you're when you're back open in your various steps. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who joined us this evening for uh, the talk. Um, uh, once again, when you leave tonight, please do take a couple of minutes to complete that very quick survey that will help us. And I hope that we'll see many of you back uh, for another of our talks uh, in the series as we go forward. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, stay safe, stay well, and I hope to see you again very soon. Good night. Bye.